Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the Rogers Communications, Inc. second quarter 2024 results conference call. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. After the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star then zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to David Nacarado, Director of Investor Relations with Rogers Communications. Please go ahead, Mr. Nacarado. Thanks, Kayleen, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, I'm here with our President and Chief Executive Officer, Tony Staffieri, and our Chief Financial Officer, Glenn Brandt. Today's discussion will include estimates and other forward-looking information from which our actual results could differ. Please review the cautionary language in today's earnings report and in our 2023 annual report regarding the various factors, assumptions, and risks that could cause our actual results to differ. With that, let me turn it over to Tony to begin. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to report that Rogers delivered another strong quarter of leading financial and operating results. For 10 straight quarters, we have executed our plan with discipline in a healthy and competitive growing market. Our results speak for themselves. In the second quarter, wireless service revenue and adjusted EBITDA were both up a healthy 4% and 6% respectively. Our focus on efficiency and disciplined market share growth is reflected in our industry-leading loading and industry-leading wireless margins of 65%. In wireless, we led the market with 162,000 mobile phone net additions. This included 112,000 postpaid mobile phone net additions and 50,000 prepaid mobile phone net ads. The increase in prepaid net additions reflects our strategy this quarter to increasingly address the flanker market with our prepaid brand, which has also had a successful value proposition for the new-to-Canada market. This approach allowed us to continue to do well in the flanker category while at the same time keeping our focus on penetration growth on the Rogers brand where the majority of our subscriber loading occurred. As a result, and importantly, we continue to post positive ARPU growth, this quarter at 1%. Overall, we are delivering industry-leading loading with industry-leading financials in wireless. This robust performance over the past two and a half years is not an accident. We have a clear plan, and we're executing with discipline, day after day, week after week, quarter after quarter. And it's underpinned by our robust national distribution network, the value and flexibility of our Rogers 5G plans, and our record industry-leading investments to build Canada's largest and most reliable 5G network. Just this week, two global leaders in network benchmarking reaffirmed our network leadership position. Excuse me. Umlaut once again awarded Rogers Canada's most reliable 5G network, finding that our wireless networks outperformed those of our competitors in reliability which is increasingly what matters most to our customers. In a separate benchmarking study, OpenSignal recognized Rogers for delivering the most reliable wireless services in Canada. OpenSignal also named Rogers Canada's fastest and most reliable internet. The report found we consistently deliver the most reliable experience, the fastest overall download speeds, and the best streaming experience in Canada. With a clear strategy, sustained effort, and smart investments, we're delivering the most reliable network experience to Canadians. In cable, we remain focused on returning to modest growth in the fourth quarter while maintaining industry-leading financials. Cable revenue is down 2% in the quarter, reflecting a slight sequential improvement from down 3% in the first quarter. Adjusted EBITDA was up an impressive 9%, and cable margins expanded to 57%, a company and industry best. Our teams continue to work diligently to drive efficiency throughout the business, and we are targeting additional improvements throughout this year. In Internet, we deliver 26,000 net new subscribers, up slightly from one year ago. 
The environment remains competitive in both the East and West, and we continue to drive growth through enterprise, MDUs, and the expansion of our TPIA and 5G home Internet offering. In addition to our fixed wireless access launch earlier in the year, we've just expanded our TPIA offering in Quebec with the launch of TV and Internet services in the province. It's early days, but we see a big opportunity to grow in Quebec, just like we do in southwestern Ontario, where we've also launched. With Shaw, we doubled our cable footprint to reach just over 60% of Canadian households. Now, with our fixed wireless access and TPIA network offerings, we're expanding our home product and coverage to reach almost 100% of Canadian households. We see this as an important strategic expansion as our wireless network covers almost 100% of all Canadians. Our satellite initiative will also further solidify our coverage leadership. We also continue to advance our DOCSIS roadmap. We're successfully trialing DOCSIS 4.0 modem technology in select Calgary customer homes using our enhanced cable plant. This is a global first, and it's delivering four gigabits download and one gigabit upload speeds at an extremely low cost per home. In the more immediate term, we continue to execute on our plans to return the cable business back to organic revenue growth by year end. We will pursue this growth in a disciplined and targeted manner. Finally, in media, top line grew by 7%, led by revenue growth at the Toronto Blue Jays, and adjusted EBITDA was break even. The third quarter is seasonally strong for our media business, and we fully expect media to return to profitability in the second half of the year. At the same time, we continue to invest in the future and long-term growth. Our landmark content deals with Warner Brothers Discovery and NBC Universal is part of that investment. Through these deals, we will bring Canadians the most watched lifestyle and entertainment shows on their platform of choice. Before I turn things over to Glenn, let me say that our teams have worked extremely hard to deliver strong results in a competitive market. Rogers continues to consistently deliver industry-leading financial results and best-in-class customer growth. In the past 10 quarters, we've added an impressive industry-best 1.7 million mobile phone and internet net additions. More Canadians are choosing Rogers than any other carrier, full stop. We've done this by out-executing our competitors and making strategic record investments to grow our business. I'm proud of our team and I'm confident in our plan to drive continued growth while maintaining our track record to delivered disciplined financial results. Let me now turn the call over to Glenn. Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Roger's second quarter results reflect another quarter of disciplined industry-leading growth and strong operating and financial performance. As Tony has said, this marks our 10th consecutive quarter leading the Canadian telecom sector in performance. We are focused and we are determined to meet our commitments. Succinctly, we are consistently doing what we have said we would do. Wireless service revenue in the quarter grew 4% year over year, driven by disciplined execution across all of our sales channels from coast to coast. Our targeted strategy of driving higher value for our customers through feature-rich 5G services from our Rogers Premium brand remains critical to driving this growth. Postpaid mobile phone customer net additions were 112,000 and prepaid net additions were 50,000. We anticipate our total net ads of 162,000 customers will once again lead the industry in market share and subscriber growth while very importantly still leading on financial performance. Through a very active and competitive flanker brand market, Rogers has led across a combination of postpaid and prepaid mobile phone net ads. Our prepaid net ads reflect our commitment to compete across the entire breadth of the market. And our feature-rich 5G service plans remain exclusively available under the Rogers Premium brand which remains core to sustaining our strong margins and leading performance in a growing and competitive market. Once again, our mobile phone ARPU was up 1% year over year, again reflecting our disciplined approach to the market and our emphasis on the premium Rogers brand. 
In a very competitive market, we remained disciplined in finding a path to leading growth while emphasizing premium services to protect margins. Postpaid mobile phone churn in the quarter was 1.07%, a modest increase of 20 basis points year over year, further reflecting our balanced, disciplined approach in the growing and very competitive market. Wireless adjusted EBITDA was up a strong 6% year over year, and our adjusted EBITDA margin grew by 160 basis points over the prior year to 65%. This is a company all-time high, reflecting our team's exceptional work on driving cost efficiencies. Moving to our cable business, we remain committed to returning our cable business back to organic revenue growth by the fourth quarter of this year, and this quarter's results reflect those efforts. Cable revenue was down negative 2% year over year, a sequential improvement from the negative 3% decline in Q1 and prior quarters. We will continue our drive to overall cable revenue growth through the second half through a combination of subscriber growth and disciplined pricing. Cable adjusted EBITDA was up a very strong 9% year over year, reflecting our continued success in driving scale efficiencies and cost synergies. This strong 9% adjusted EBITDA growth drove a very strong adjusted EBITDA cable margin of 57%, up from 51% in the prior year and up from 56% sequentially from the first quarter. We anticipate additional efficiency gains and margin improvements through the second half. A key element to returning our cable revenue to modest growth in Q4 of this year will be through customer growth and we are encouraged by our continued improving performance in retail internet net additions. Internet net additions were 26,000 in the second quarter, a slight increase from one year ago and consistent with our first quarter performance. This level of loading, combined with our industry best margin performance, further reflects our balanced approach to driving growth while maintaining disciplined pricing. This will continue through the second half. Finally, our sports and media revenue was up 7% and adjusted EBITDA was break-even. We expect our sports and media business to be profitable through the seasonally strong second half and for the full year, driven primarily by revenue growth at the Toronto Blue Jays and Sportsnet. The completed renovations at Rogers Centre have been very well received by fans, and while the Blue Jays season has not lived up to expectations through the first half, Sportsnet performance remains very strong driven in large part by the Blue Jays and by the Edmonton Oilers' Stanley Cup run. At a consolidated level, Q2 total service revenue increased 1% and adjusted EBITDA was up 6% year over year. This drove our consolidated EBITDA margin up by 230 basis points year over year to 46%. Free cash flow also remains strong reaching $666 million in the quarter, which is up 40% from the prior year, reflecting higher adjusted EBITDA, lower capital expenditures, and lower interest on long-term debt. Capital expenditures were $1 billion in the quarter, down $80 million, or 7%, from last year. Turning to the balance sheet, at June 30th, we had $4.3 billion of available liquidity, including $450 million in cash and short-term deposits and $3.9 billion available under our bank credit facilities. Our weighted average interest rate on all borrowings is 4.7%, down from 4.9% at year-end, and our weighted average term to maturity is 10 years. Our 4.7 times debt leverage ratio was flat to Q1 of this year, made more notable in that our Q2 leverage includes our $475 million investment made in the first half for the 3,800 MHz spectrum we won at the auction last year, $380 million of which was made in Q2. Absent this $475 million investment, leverage in Q2 would have improved to 4.6 times. We remain focused on reducing leverage through the second half, 
targeting 4.2 times by year end. Our target is to reduce leverage by roughly half a turn each year, supported by a combination of earnings growth and paying down debt with available free cash flow and proceeds from asset sales. As we have indicated in prior quarters, we have processes currently underway to sell targeted non-core assets, predominantly real estate assets, worth an estimated $1 billion. These asset sales are taking longer than originally anticipated as a result of continued softness in the market ahead of anticipated interest rate reductions. We remain committed to this initiative. However, we are also focused on ensuring we drive maximum proceeds. And finally, as you read in our press release this morning, we are reaffirming all of our 2024 guidance range targets. We remain confident in our continued disciplined execution, working to drive cost efficiencies and improved margins while investing in our growing markets and services. We are focused on driving growth and on delevering our balance sheet, as reflected in this quarter's strong results. As I indicated in my opening, and as you heard in Tony's remarks, we are meeting our commitments. We are doing what we said we would do. Let me conclude by congratulating and thanking our incredible team of dedicated and proud employees for their leadership. For the 10th consecutive quarter, we have delivered leading performance in a growing and highly competitive marketplace. Thank you for your time this morning. And with that, Gaylene, can we please commence with the Q&A? Thank you. Certainly. We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. The first question comes from Drew McReynolds with RBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much uh, and and good morning. Um, Two for me. Um, first, uh, maybe, uh, I guess Tony or Glenn, um, with respect to just on the wireless side and, you know, what appears to be kind of continued, uh, demand for the Rogers main brand kind of value proposition. Can you just give us a little sense of, you know, what's driving that particularly? Um, cause obviously given kind of the ARPU performance, there's, demand there and up tiering uh, still happening. Um, just curious from a consumer spec- perspective, is it you know speed, quality of service, data buckets, um, you know other premium kind of content that's offered? I uh, would love to kind of get a, a sense of that. And then second, um, Glenn, good to hear just kind of continued expectation of margin expansion uh, within cable. Um, looks like y- you're probably spending about a billion on TV programming costs. Uh, which is a relatively big number. And I know you and Tony have talked about kind of modernizing kind of the TV uh, proposition in consumers' homes for what people actually want to watch. Just wondering how, you know, your expectation is on on bringing down those programming costs over time or maybe set a different way, optimizing those programming costs just to align with what uh, consumers want to watch. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, uh, Drew. I'll start with the uh, first one on wireless. Um, As you pointed out, and I said in my opening remarks, uh, the majority of our net subscriber additions continue to be on the Rogers brand. Um, A while ago, we set out on a strategy to focus uh, on the Rogers brand and drive growth uh, uh, on Rogers. Uh, So there are a few things that we're seeing uh, that's contributing to our success there. Um, first and foremost, it's the network. Um, you know, as I said in the comments, reliability is becoming more and more important, and we were extremely pleased uh, to see Umlaut and OpenSignal uh, reaffirm our network performance and, and best reliability. Um, that is the single uh, biggest driver of um, churn. Um, reduction as well as uh, new acquisitions. Uh, Secondarily, we continue to lean on our distribution network across the country. Uh, It has been extremely effective for us um, in all the channels um, in both large markets as well as in uh, what we would call smaller markets uh, as well. Um, 
In terms of offerings um, uh, on the Rogers brand, uh, we introduced Disney Plus, and that's been helpful to it. Um, but the other piece is um, convenient financing of phones. With the Rogers MasterCard, c- consumers can finance their uh, acquisition of phones over 48 months and effectively cut their monthly bill in half uh, when it comes to uh, paying for the phone. And so that's been extremely helpful uh, as well. So those are some of the big factors. Um, and then the last one is uh, the power of bundling. Um, our wireless together with our home products, particularly in the West. The ability to now bring comp- more competition to the West um, has been a good source of growth for us. Alberta and BC continue to be our fastest growing markets with healthy market share, and, um, and that's contributed uh, to the overall Rogers loading. And then, uh, Drew, on your, on your question on, on programming costs, we, we really are just at the start of, of uh, addressing that category. It's a large category. It's going to take some time. Uh, some of the contracts we have in place run over multiple quarters, um, and some of it is shifting customer prev- presence but uh, or, or customer um, uh, channel choices. That takes time. However, we've uh, we've initiated a program. You saw the Warner deal, where we we are now going directly to the studio and buying the programming. That's that's a start. Um, we are looking to source, um, you know, leading programming that the customers watch, making that available and making that available at uh, at lower margins by cutting out the uh, the middle uh, the middleman company and uh, and going direct and so you saw that we will continue you know efforts uh, and opportunities in that vein this is going to take multiple quarters to uh, uh, to fully uh, fill in but we're at we're, we're at a good start okay thanks very much thanks drew thanks drew uh, next question Gaylene. yes the next question is from Vince Valentini with TD Cullen please go ahead Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks, Vince. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask about prepaid, which is a topic we don't talk about much, but you had a pretty big uptick in prepaid uh, this quarter. And two two part question. One, with the change in your deactivation policy last year, is there a new seasonality perhaps of people who would come in and out, you know, in year, like maybe there's some seasonality of people coming in in Q2, and those people people will quickly deactivate in Q3 or Q4. Just wonder if there's anything we should think about for modeling, because uh, this was a bit of a surprise to us how high prepaid was this quarter. And second part, maybe more important, can you give us a little evidence and history on your track record of being able to migrate people from prepaid to postpaid? How successful are you in that? How long does it typically take? If there's any percentage you can give, it'd be Wonderful, but I don't uh, expect the moon, but any color you give will be helpful. Thanks. Thanks for the questions, Vince. A um, um, couple of items uh, that I'll uh, go through. Uh, so, so this quarter, we decided to leverage our chatter brand in the flanker space, and uh, we're pleased with the results we saw there. The chatter brand is a low-cost and very simple to activate uh, type of process. And it's particularly well suited for the new to Canada uh, that don't necessarily have a credit history. And so as we leaned on that brand, uh, we found it to be very successful. I should tell you that uh, the average ARPU in of prepaid is just under $30. And most of the customers are on auto pay. And so they very much look and feel like, um, you know, what I would describe as the, the flanker category. Um, and so it's been a very successful entry point uh, into our ecosystem. We continue to focus and do well on the pre to post migration. Um, we don't share numbers on that, but we are uh, extremely successful in migrating those customers to, uh, to a postpaid brand. Um, and surprisingly, um, many will go right from the Chatter prepaid brand right to Rogers brand. Uh, and so that's been uh, very successful for us. In terms of the seasonality, there is a little bit of uh, seasonal uptick in the second quarter, uh, but that isn't what contributed to um, the large increase in prepaid subscribers in Q2. 
so just to be clear, we, we shouldn't expect some sort of spike in churn and, and negative prepaid in, in Q3 as an offset. This is mostly organic success. That's right, Vince. Um, there always is seasonality, in turn, as you point out, um, in subsequent quarters, but don't expect um, a net negative in future quarters. This is uh, organic that we see um, uh, long term uh, as being long term customers for us. Great. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Uh, next question, please, Eileen. The next question is from Meher Yagi with Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, encouraging results, so guys, in a competitive market. Uh, you have uh, you know, stayed on side in terms of ARPU growth and wireless, while others uh, have uh, not. How should we think about your ARPU trends in wireless in the second half? It looks like pricing is finding a bottom here. What, what are the risks in your view when it comes to back to school and the dynamics over there to uh, pressure uh, our pool beyond what we have seen already? Um, and the second question I have is on 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 leverage. Uh, you know, telcos. It's the hardest thing for them to deliver. Uh, and Glenn, you mentioned that you had to pay for Spectrum in Q2. Um, I know you mentioned that you continue to look for divestitures to occur before the end of the year uh, with you know that billion dollar free real estate. But any other opportunities uh, beyond that billion dollar of real estate uh, that you can look at um, that you know, you don't need necessarily to own, but you can rent um, to run the business. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, Mayor. I'll start with the uh, first one. Um, we continue to focus on not only leading market share, but continuing to drive ARPU growth. And so as we look to the back half of the year, our expectation is uh, we will continue uh, to be on the growth side of ARPU. Uh, while there are pressures, um, as you would expect, um, we have a number of initiatives that we're driving that um, we're confident uh, will continue to, uh, to have solid ARPU growth for us. As we head into back to school, our expectation is, uh, of course, it's going to be uh, competitive, just like it is every year. Um, as we enter the back half, um, more than half um, the annual loadings uh, occur starting with back to school. Um, and so as that kicks off in the coming days and weeks, um, you can expect us to focus on the Rogers brand uh, in the back to school category, uh, together with um, bundling with our home internet and in particular our 5G uh, fixed wireless access product uh, for internet. Um, our focus um, has been and will continue to be on the value proposition uh, beyond just price. Um, our expectation is to continue to be disciplined on handset financing um, and our approach there. Uh, we don't see ourselves moving into subsidizing handsets, um, which uh, one of our competitors is focused on, uh, we have a different value proposition, and we're going to focus on 5G and the Rogers brand, as I said. And then, Mayor, on, on delevering, um, we've our, our prime uh, two sources of delevering we have well in hand. It's earnings growth and it's free cash flow. Seasonally, most of our free cash flow comes in the second half, and in, in fact, it, it comes in the last four months of the year. Um, that's just seasonally how how uh, our free cash flow generally hits uh, hits through the year. And so, when you look at you know, we've given guidance of, of free cash flow um, around three billion dollars, range two point nine to to three point one billion. So, for ease of, of numbers, call it three billion dollars. Our cash pay dividends now are somewhere in the range of $700 million and change. Um, that leaves two and a quarter billion dollars, roughly, for us to use to invest. Well, half a billion in Spectrum this year, so that comes out of available free cash flow. The rest we will use to pay down debt. 
those two first and foremost we have in hand and and those are um those are our our key drivers in delevering quarter after quarter year after year um and you see the impact of that uh, through this quarter and and prior quarters on the asset sales we will complete asset sales um you're right real estate we've got some that's vacant that we can sell we've got some that we own that we occupy and and could you know sell and lease back um the greatest productivity comes from selling assets that you don't need to lease back but if uh if there are transactions there that make sense on uh uh on looking at the other we will uh, but we we've got time and we're not uh, we're certainly not in a fire sale um you saw us pivot at the end of last year realizing the market was softer than we had expected on the asset sales and you know we sold the Kojiko shares um we took advantage of an uptick in the market and and brought in uh some you know a significant debt reduction in the in the tail end of last year that bought us some time and allowed us some leeway to to not fire sale our our real estate and uh um you know non core asset holdings we are still focused on uh, on driving those sales though thank you thanks mayor thanks mayor next question Gaylene. the next question is from david barden with bank of america please go ahead Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the question. It's uh, Matt uh, sitting in for Dave this morning. Um, two, if I could, uh, just on wireless, I wanted to just follow up on the uh, on Drew's question um, or the answer to it. Uh, I know the focus has been on the uh, Rogers brand, um, you know, with its improved network quality. Obviously, bundling is is something that's you know happening more and more in the market. So, I, you know, given that um, and uh, you know, we still see churn sort of ticking up. Um, I wonder how you viewed that, if, if you view the churn as a return to normal or if we should see as this strategy continues to play out that we should see some churn benefits uh, going forward that we should be modeling in. And then just on cable, you know, obviously encouraging this, the, uh, the view of, of growth or returning to top-line growth um, by year-end. Um, you know, should we uh, factor in uh, some price increases in the back half of the year? Um, I know that there's a whole host of items, including, you know, the, the enterprise segment, TPIA, fixed wireless access, um, MDUs in the West. But, you know, in that mix, is, is our price increases going to play uh, a role in, in getting that um, inflection point to positive? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the questions, Matt. Um, let me start with um, on the wireless side. Um, as you said, just uh, filling in uh, from the response I gave to uh, Drew um, and the impact on, on churn uh, longer term. If you look at the quarter in the last several quarters, there's been heightened churn. It's probably worth dissecting for you that as we focus on the Rogers brand, what we're seeing is uh, on that brand um, improving churn. And uh, as customers get on uh, the 5G network, and we're very disciplined about 5G being only available on the Rogers brand, um, and in particular as they get to, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, as they get to unlimited plans uh, and the simplicity of the billing of it and certainty of the billing. Um, and the performance of the network, uh, those have been good drivers uh, to improve churn and customer loyalty uh, on the Rogers brand. As you look to the overall combined churn, most of that is happening in the flanker category, um, uh, quite frankly. And so uh, what we are seeing is customers um, uh, moving around in that space uh, as they are more price conscious. Um, and we also see some customers going from postpaid to prepaid, uh, given the similarity of the product and, and some of the advantages that prepaid have for them. Um, as we look to um, medium term, we've said that we would expect churn levels to continue to be elevated uh, for those re reasons. Long term, as we look out uh, beyond the next three to four quarters, our expectation is we will see churn levels likely uh, decline. 
but we think it'll be some time um, before we uh, we enter that that space. Notwithstanding that, um, the churn is happening against the backdrop of a continuing growing market, and so while churn is up for the industry overall. Um, Gross ads are up uh, significantly, and our market share in gross ads continues to uh, be strong, leading, and continues to improve. And so on a net ad basis, um, we see the market continuing to grow in the roughly 43 to 4.5% range for the year. Uh, overall for the industry uh, would be our best estimate. Um, and within that, um, we expect to continue to lead on market share uh, on net ads. And then, Matt, on your question on cable returning to growth, um, I won't get into specifics around any any uh, um, you know, marketing strategy or that. Um, I don't want to pre announce anything, um, but I, I would you know say through this quarter, we've been you know you've heard me several times in my prepared comments refer to disciplined um, part of pricing is not so much the posted price or, or increases or that, but being disciplined on some of the discounting that uh, that is offered. Um, we've seen a very active market, uh, a very competitive market. We are um, focused and careful on, uh, on where we lean in and on where we pull back on some of that discounting. And so you see some of that through the second quarter. You'll continue to see that uh, through the second half of the year. It's, uh, it's block and tackle as opposed to any, you know, any magic bullet of let's, let's simply charge more for, uh, for services. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Next question, please, Kayleen. Certainly. The next question is from Stephanie Price with CIBC. Please go ahead. Good morning. I had uh, two questions on the cable business as well. Um, maybe first I was hoping you could talk about the uptake you're seeing in the fixed wireless offerings and how you kind of think about that mix of fixed wireless versus TPIA as you move into the 40% of the country where you don't have a wireline presence. And then second, just on cable margins, obviously very strong in the quarter, and, and commentary was encouraging about, you know, the potential to increase that. Just curious about what other initiatives you have underway and how you think about driving margins from here. Thanks for the question, Stephanie. Um, <clears throat> since launching uh, Fixed Wireless Access, uh, we launched it nationally uh, with a focus and um, attempt to index uh, towards um, areas where we don't have a uh, cable footprint, namely Quebec and southwestern Ontario, uh, certain parts of it. And um, uh, we're very pleased uh, with the success of the product, the appeal of the product. Um, consumers and businesses find it very uh, simple to buy and get up and running um, literally within seconds. Um, and so the product is doing well, not only in those markets, uh, but nationally as well. We're finding that certain segments, including um, students um, entering Canada and new to Canada, that are still finding themselves somewhat mobile in terms of where they're going to be living, um, have an affinity to the product uh, because it's convenient um, and it is mobile for them. Um, and so fixed wireless access is uh, is doing doing well relative to TPIA. We just launched that. Um, as I've talked about before, we purchased ComWave to give us the platform uh, back in the fourth quarter, and we wanted to relaunch the product that would include um, not only Rogers uh, Internet um, on TPIA, uh, but the full suite of products that we offer, um, and in particular the entertainment uh, product uh, Rogers Xfinity. And so uh, it's still early days, and comparing the two is somewhat difficult, uh, just given the, the different timeline. Um, we see a different use case for each of them, um, depending on the customer's needs in terms of uh, bandwidth that they're looking for. Um, you know, generally within uh, a home where there are multiple users, um, entertainment happening at the same time as video calls, et cetera. Uh, our view right now is that TPIA would be the better solution, uh, but as we deploy network slicing, uh, the potential for fixed wireless access uh, use cases continues to increase as well. So we'll, 
we'll offer both and we'll let the market decide. <coughs> Excuse me, and we'll let the market decide um, what uh, fits the customer needs best. And then, Stephanie, on your your question on cable margins and and what other initiatives we're looking at, um, I'm encouraged by the question, given that we're we're one year into the um, you know post acquisition of Shaw, and and uh, and you're asking whether or not we've we've filled in or still have more opportunity. We still have more opportunity, but I'm very pleased with the progress we've made to date on integrating the people and and working through the people cost side of things. But there are still some very large initiatives and large opportunities. We are still fully engaged on the systems integration and some of the improvements that come from uh, from that, our ERP systems, that uh, that work remains underway. That will help drive some efficiencies in uh, uh, in the boring operation side of things that, that really uh, helps to uh, uh, provide customer service improvements as well as pulling some uh, cost efficiencies uh, uh, out or cost inefficiencies out. Um, we are still working on vendor negotiations. Some of those contracts we had in place were multi-year, and we've worked through a significant portion of them, but there were still more. And we are now uh, twice the scale on the wireline side of things, and so that helps uh, helps on uh, providing future year's opportunities as uh, uh, as we lean in on those contracts. We have not yet fully... Uh, we're, we're at the start. We haven't yet fully um, uh, filled the wireline or fiber backhaul, replacing microwave backhaul. That's really early days. Um, the construction is underway, but lightening up on our microwave backhaul for our wireless cell sites, that we will fill in over the next uh, few years, uh, providing opportunity for lowering microwave costs. Um, and then finally, we're really just getting started on the media content costs. And you saw um, and heard my, you know, my earlier answer on some of those efforts with the uh, the Warner deal and, and going direct to studios. Um, that is a balance between finding lower cost ways of sourcing the content, as well as gearing the content delivery to customers that you know with what they actually watch, rather than. Here's a full slate of channels, many of which never uh, never get tuned in. So we still have several initiatives um, that we will fill in, not just over the next few quarters, but over the next few years. Still lots Thank of opportunities. You. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Next question, Gaylene. The next question is from Tim Casey with BMO. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Good morning, uh, Tony. Could you talk a little bit about what you've the progression of what you've seen in terms of uh, competitive pricing in the wireless market, and how you're thinking about how it's going to play out through back to school, um, particularly with respect to last year. I mean, obviously there will be back to school promotional activity, but I think the market would be very interested to hear. Investors would be very interested to hear. How what your take is on um, the projection or the the trajectory of, of pricing offers out there as we go into the into the seasonal period this year? Thanks for the question, Tim. Uh, it's always hard to predict the market dynamics. Uh, we have a plan of uh, what we intend to do um, as we kick off the season with back to school. Um, as I said in my earlier comments, our focus will be. Uh, continue to be on the Rogers brand um, and continue to be on bundling um, and a few other things that you would expect to be relevant uh, to students um, and the addition of uh, second, third, or fourth line uh, to the plan. So, um, um, and we'll work our distribution channels um, to effectively um, compete uh, during that season. In terms of, um, and maybe your question is, you know, how do we think it'll compare to last year? Um, we had four robust competitors in the marketplace last year, and uh, um, and we have the same uh, competitors in the marketplace uh, this year. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, our expectation is uh, it's going to be competitive, um, and uh, at least on par with uh, last year. 
um, in terms of uh, pricing dynamics and promotional offers. Uh, we'll just have to see um, what uh, what the competition does and we'll respond uh, accordingly. Uh, but um, uh, at a very macro level, our expectation is uh, it's probably not going to be that different uh, than the prior year. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Tony. And that's just on um, on the bundling environment, any changes you're seeing there with respect to cable um, uh, competitive intensity, um, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about it, what you're seeing in Ontario with what you're seeing out west on that dynamic. Um, it's important to um, set out um, that you know the bundled customer is still not the majority of customers uh, across the entire nation, and that's true not only for us uh, but the industry overall. Um, and so bundling has uh, a lot of appeal uh, beyond just the uh, bundled discount. Um, but it's still, uh, frankly, early days in terms of bundling. As I said, it has some convenience. And part of the appeal of fixed wireless access is you can uh, walk out of the store with a phone um, as well as home Internet uh, that's just ready to go. And so it's a simple, easy process. Um, but in terms of the trend we're seeing in bundling um, between East and West, it's about the same. Um, I would say there's probably a bit more inertia in the West only because we haven't been able to offer the bundled pro product previously uh, prior to closing Shaw. And so having an alternative out West um, has given us a, a bit of an advantage. And, and so we're seeing it slightly higher uh, in the West. Um, but longer term, we expect the, the use case to be uh, the same across the nation. Thanks, Tim. Next question, please, Kayleen. The next question is from Batya Levy with UBS. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, can you provide a little bit more color on the drivers of wireless ARPU growth going forward? Um, uh, do you think that the lower mix of flanker brand in there is still a driver? And how should we think about accounting for um, Disney Plus add-on? Does that also drive better ARPO? Thank you. Thanks, Batia, for the question. Um, you know, as I said earlier, our expectation is to continue to focus on not only um, leading market share, um, but leading ARPU growth as well. And uh, so there are, you know, things we focus on there. One is focusing on the Rogers brand um, and base management. Um, you know, it's, uh, Glenn referred to it earlier. It's basic blocking and tackling of looking at a customer set and, um, you know, is there a value proposition relative to the plan that they're on now, um, proactively outreaching the customer. So it's, it's things like that. And so in base management, uh, we like what we see in um, – uh, up tiering customers on the Rogers brand and customers on either the FIDO and as I referenced earlier on the Chatter brand and up tiering them to uh, the 5G network and um, uh, the Rogers uh, brand. Um, so that's, um, you know, in and of itself, uh, the, the single biggest driver um, of uh, continued expansion. The second area is uh, roaming and um, coming up with. Um, roaming alternatives and packages that give the customer more certainty um, and at the same time uh, gives us more consistency in that type of revenue. And so as we introduce uh, some of those plans in market, um, we expect that to have a, a favorable impact on, uh, on ARPU as well. Um, beyond that, I really don't want to get into too many of our um, uh, marketing plans for competitive reasons um, other than um, you know, those are probably um, two of the items that um, are going to be uh, most significant, um, but frankly, most basic. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Batcha. Uh, next question, Kayleen. The next question is from Jerome Deville with Desjardins. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for, for taking my questions. Uh, first one is on TPI in Quebec. Uh, you're, you're putting emphasis on the strategic move there. Um, interesting, uh, given your relatively large coverage of the country on, on the fixed side of the question, and, and we're just ahead of the CRTC decision. Uh, so obviously, your Conway acquisition kind of 
hinted towards that, but if you can remind us of your regulatory view on TPIA and how you see this evolve. And then second question um, on EBITDA growth regarding uh, regarding guidance. If I if math, if my math is good, I we need to uh, to see a bit of an acceleration in terms of EBITDA growth versus what we've been seeing in the second quarter. Uh, if you can discuss what would be the drivers for accelerated EBITDA growth in the second half versus the second quarter. Um, I'll start with the first one, uh, Jerome. In terms of you know, our views on TPIA, uh, we've been consistent on point. Uh, we need a regulatory framework and environment that continues to encourage facilities-based investment. Um, that's critical uh, to having uh, networks and growing networks uh, across the, the nation. Uh, it's important to facilitate uh, rural connectivity, and it's an agenda that we all share. Um, and so first and foremost, having wholesale rates uh, if we are going to have a wholesale regime, which we do, uh, and the government seems committed to it, then we need to ensure uh, that the rates uh, reflect full costs. Um, and um, so that's point one. And the second point is if we are going to have a wholesale regulatory regime, then it needs to be fair and consistent across all networks. Um, and so those are, those are our views uh, on that. Um, We've, um, um, you know, as I said in my earlier comments, as we look to some of the markets where we don't have homes passed, um, customers are looking for solutions to bundle with their wireless product. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to um, expand into those markets and, and offer those bundled solutions. And then on uh, on your second question, Jerome, on the, the EBITDA growth through the first half of the year, if if you you know take 2023 and this is true if you go back in prior years, um, a larger portion of our annual EBITDA is earned in the second half of the year. Um, if you look at last year, 45% of our um, our annual EBITDA was earned in the first half. If you factor in the fact that Q1 didn't include Shaw, you pull that in. It, it goes up by one or two points to about 47% of the year's EBITDA earned in the first half, just over half then in the second half. I expect that pattern will uh, will bear out again this year. Um, media is very, very strongly seasonal in the second half, um, and so that's you know part of the driver. Um, media is not a significant part of the consolidated EBITDA, maybe in percentage terms, but um, uh, almost the entire amount of EBITDA earned by media comes in the last four to six months of the year. Um, the uh, the baseball season and the NHL season both are heavy uh, second half related, and so you know I'm uh, I'm confident that uh, you know we will. Uh, um, we will bear out those patterns in the second half. I'm very confident with uh, with the guidance we've given. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Thanks, Jerome. Uh, Gaylene, we have time for two more questions. Thank you. The next question is from Aravinda Galapatike with Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, just a clarification on the wireless service revenue uh, growth trajectory. Um, you know, the 3.5% that's possibly still going to be sort of sector leading, you know, given the uh, the competitive conditions in the market. But, um, you know, previously, pro forma, you were sort of well north of uh, 5%, I suspect even a lot of 6%. Um, I'll I was perhaps maybe a little bit surprised by that trajectory sequentially. Um, even if you look at sort of the sequential numbers, Q2 seasonally normally gets an uptick in terms of wireless uh, service revenues from Q1. Um, apart from what we already know in terms of sort of the pricing pressures, uh, was there any sort of item that sort of needs to be called out, whether it's roaming or uh, other fees that, that sort of played a role there? Um, and secondly, just a bigger picture question, uh, longer term cost reduction. I mean, uh, maybe for Tony, how, how do you see the, the, the 
prospect of, of uh, larger sort of cost rationalization uh, in the industry when you sort of think about Gen AI, when you think about sort of uh, the broad opportunities in, in this um, uh, for the telecom sector to to sort of manage their margins as you sort of face tighter service revenue conditions possibly um, like we see right now. Just uh, wanted your thoughts on that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Arvind. On your your questions around wireless revenue growth, um, I'm I'm pleased with the growth we've had. We always look for more, but uh, um, in a very competitive market where you know I think we've we heard significant concerns expressed from the outside. We've held to our plan. We've held to our discipline on pricing, on price discounting, on going after market share while still protecting our margins and our our revenue growth. Um, we are lapping you know, strong performance in the prior year and still posting good growth this year. You're right, the 4% we posted in Q2 is, uh, is down sequentially maybe from where we were in Q1 by a point, but uh, um, we've, we've driven 4% revenue growth and 6% EBITDA growth. Um, I'm... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say satisfied or pleased, but uh, but certainly those are strong results given the very competitive market that uh, that we're operating in, um, and uh, and where we can find opportunities to um, to upgrade customer service plans to uh, to move customers up to the premium brand. We are leaning in on those. Data loading um, continues to grow by uh, roughly 30%. Uh, year over year, and uh, and we are you know looking to those trends to move customers into uh, higher service plans, moving them into 5G service and what have you. Um, on on roaming, those trends really have largely um, been fully ingested. We uh, we will look to try and find some opportunities. Uh, Tony mentioned on uh, on making uh, roaming more convenient for customers going forward, but uh, I don't expect uh, those to have a mere material impact on uh, uh, on future revenue. On the uh, second part of your question, Arvind, on cost reductions, do do we continue to see opportunities? And the short answer is absolutely. Um, we will continue to seek efficiency improvements and. Uh, the tools that are increasingly becoming available um, are uh, going to greatly assist. Um, you mentioned AI, uh, and we're being very thoughtful and selective uh, about the tools that um, we will, uh, in most cases, uh, license um, from uh, larger players that uh, that have solutions that are ready to go, um, and we see that being able to uh, uh, take out a bit of cost. Um, not only in our customer interactions, uh, but also in in many of our back office and network operations. Um, and those tools uh, are already being implemented with uh, with really good uh, early success on it. And the second big part of it is just uh, transacting digitally uh, as an industry um, overall, but particularly in Canada. Um, it's probably fair to say that um, it's still um, uh, a significant minority of transactions uh, that happen digitally, um, and we know that consumers and businesses are looking for alternatives that are easier and quicker uh, to transact. And so as we improve our digital capabilities, our expectation is the customer is going to have a much better experience at a significantly uh, lower cost. Uh, and so we'll continue to invest in those areas. Um, and you'll see that uh, some of it in our CapEx, but also in OpEx as we license many of these uh, platforms. Um, and um, uh, But nonetheless, um, uh, with that, uh, we'll, it'll be within the CapEx envelope we have um, and within uh, our goal to continue to expand margins. Um, so continued opportunities for sure, Arvinda. Thank you. Thanks, Arvinda. Uh, Galen, we have time for one more question. Thank you. The final question is from David McFadgen with Coremark Securities. Please go ahead. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for asking uh, me. And um, so, just when I look at the wireless business, 
Uh, your other operating costs in the quarter were down 3% year over year. I was just wondering, is there something unusual in the quarter, or could we expect this uh, result to continue in future quarters? And then on the cable side of the business, um, you know, we saw an uptick in the video losses. I was just wondering, is this a new run rate? And in your written commentary, you called out uh, satellite losses as being a factor which drove the cable revenue down a little bit. You don't disclose uh, your satellite subs, so I was just wondering, can you, would you be able to disclose the magnitude of the satellite losses in the quarter and the satellite sub base uh, at the end of Q2? Thanks. Thank you, David. On uh, on your question on wireless and other operating costs being down, we you know, it, again it's a uh, it's a just a, a general emphasis we have on finding efficiencies and uh, and driving out costs. And so I wouldn't point to any one thing other than um, we are looking to drive uh, scale efficiencies in cable and uh, and just overall efficiencies across the board uh in wireless media uh and head office costs so um uh, I, I won't i won't put any more granularity than that to it and then uh within cable um the satellite I, we don't we don't disclose uh specifics but uh it's no secret that satellite is a mature business um if i were to put any any magnitude on it, the uh, uh, the negative two percent uh, overall revenue decline you see in cable, um, a significant portion of that, an over a vast overweight portion of that is driven by satellite, and so uh, uh, absent uh, satellite, that uh, that negative two percent um, would have been substantially lower. And then just on that, just on the video losses uh, uh, out of satellite, you know, it picked up in the quarter. Is, is that a new run rate? Just wondering about that. Um, no, I think I think it's uh, um, likely more seasonal than anything. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, David, uh, and thanks all for joining us on our Q2 call. Uh, the IR team will be around if uh, you have any follow-ups. And, uh, Gaylene, I'll pass it over to you to close up the call. Thank you. This concludes the question and answer session and brings to a close today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant day. Thank you all.